So let's cross over to you. Let's get this uh, discussion going now. Um, let's move to the next part of the discussion, which is what I want. Does it have any bearing on Pakistan-U.S. relationship, uh, Mr. Milam? Well, let us hope not. Uh, whatever's going on here, and it's all kind of mysterious, uh, enigma wrapped in a riddle inside a puzzle to me. Uh, clearly there's some chicanery going on, but on whose part? It all seems to be within uh, the Pakistan government and only a certain part of that. So uh, my, except I might say that I had an email just out of the blue on Friday from a friend of mine who, colleague of mine at the Wilson Center who happens to be in Pakistan who said that one of the, I think, uh, editors of one of the newspapers there had engaged him in a long discussion about the, how the U.S. was complicit in this. I hope that is, I know that's not true, and I hope that that is so, uh, just thrown out and uh, blown off right away. There shouldn't be any impact on U.S.-Pakistan relations Pakistan except relations. for uh, the fact that, you know, if the balance of power changes, there will be some, we'll have to adjust to that. Uh, thank you. And since we had Mr. Ijaz on the phone and we don't have Mr. Haqqani on the phone, I must make it clear to my audience that Mr. Haqqani denies that he ever wrote this memo, that he's ever even read this memo. We have his statement and even in Pakistan he's denied that and now he's going to meet the president, the prime minister and the army chief to explain his side of the story. He denies ever having written this memo but Muid, very quickly, how important uh, of the, and Maria I'll come to you in just a second, I just want to ask you this, how important is the personality of the ambassador in Pak US relationship between any two countries? Is it even important who's at the helm or if it changes? Look, it depends. It depends. Pakistan has had all sorts of um, ambassadors um, in, in Washington, uh, political appointees, uh, career diplomats, depending on the situation, they've done fairly well or not. Uh, this is a particularly difficult time in Pakistan-U.S. relations. And I think the jury is out. There are many who say that this is the right kind of uh, personality type. There are many who say it isn't. Uh, I don't think there's any one answer here. But what is clear is that countries should never be held hostage to any individual. So, you know, if it's uh, another person tomorrow, we'll have to see how that develops. If it's the same person, things will continue the, the way they have. Countries... May I say something? First of all, I agree with Moeen completely. And secondly, since I've been an ambassador, I can tell you that the personality and the methods of operation of an ambassador make some difference. But, but not a only, lot. But it's at the margin, not very much. Really. Maria, go ahead, please. Right. Uh, Dr. Yasmin, I'd like to ask you that, you know, with all these admissions coming in from the U.S. leadership as well of, this of the existence of this memo, do you still doubt the, cre uh, the fact that it did exist? Do you, do you doubt that? Well, basically, <clears throat> I feel that uh, there has to be some sort of uh, fire uh, if there's smoke all around, you mm. know, and that's the sort of thing arising. I mean, there's constantly so much being said. And uh, then particularly... Uh, what has been said by uh, the Admiral Mullen is that he did acknowledge that there was a memo, mm. whether he acknowledged it a couple of days afterwards, mm. but he did acknowledge there was a, a, a memo. And along with that, General Jones saying that he did deliver the memo, right. which is another, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, thing, which is another fill in the gap, which has occurred. So you have to think about it, that there ha was a memo, mm. which was delivered to uh, Admiral Mullen and was delivered by an another American mm. general and he must have taken it from somebody so it must have started off and it had to be propagated from somewhere and would have reached somewhere so frankly speaking I believe that this requires a proper investigation mm. this is something which is very alarming mm. because if such sorts of allegations are there they have to be properly looked into it and Pakistan Tariq and Saf has already asked that a so motor action mm. should be taken by the Supreme Court right. because frankly speaking if this has actually occurred, then it's violation of the Constitution and this borders on to treason because this is the, right. if you look at Article 2, uh, it's, I, I think it's Article 243 and 245, where there has to be a relationship between the President and the armed forces. Hmm. This is violation of that and this frankly is bordering on treason and right. this has to be investigated properly and we must know the exact facts and figures before we can, uh, you know. Jump to conclusions. Yes. Let's cross over to Mr. Ekram Segal in Islamabad. Mr. Segal, uh, thank you for waiting so patiently. Mr. Segal, I'd like to ask you that uh, 
a question that many here in Pakistan are asking, and of course you must have heard it as well, is that if this, uh, if this memo or if these claims, these allegations are false, why isn't the Pakistani leadership suing the Financial Times? What do you believe? But absolutely, I agree with you. And I think the answer to that is uh, what your question is. Why aren't they suing it? Hmm. They're not suing the Financial Times because there's credibility behind it. Now, I'm not going to stand and give any references for Mr. Jaz, uh, but I will say this, that in the interview that he had with you and in all the conversations that I've read in the newspapers, his account comes across as very credible. And those of us who know Mr. Hussain Akani very well and the way he operates, and in fact, if you can see the way he's been operating since this memo has surfaced, is exactly the way he does things. Now, I believe that, uh, you know, because one thing is, of course, uh, quite incredible that on 9th of May, the Pakistan army was really down and out because of the Osama bin Laden affair. And uh, there was no question of a coup. But I think what happened was that Mr. Haqqani took a page out of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's book when he fired uh, the general, uh, chief of uh, army staff, General Gulasan, on 3rd March 1972. And from 3rd March 1972 till he was ousted on 5th July 1977 was the only time the civilian government really had control over the army and the ISI. And I think Mr. Haqqani, uh, of course, went to Mr. Zardari and said, this is an opportunity of a lifetime and spooked the Americans by saying that there is a coup imminent. And because of that, we can finally get control over the civilian agents, uh, the intelligence agencies like we wanted to. Now, I think <coughs> the way it has been there, why doesn't, why hasn't, look, Mr. Mansoor Jaz has got a lot to lose because in, not in Pakistani courts perhaps, but in United States courts, courts, he can be sued for defamation in a big way and the Financial Times can be sued for defamation and the very fact that, uh, you know, even today a very weak sort of a thing has come from Faranaz Isfahani about taking it up in the courts, but nobody has really uh, aired the fact that if somebody can be right. sued, gives credibility to Mr. Ijaz that what he has said is correct. I think a few weeks ago, your colleague Katrina asked me, what should the Pakistan army do about the Haqqani network in North Waziristan? And I said very clearly to her, dismantle, dismantle the Haqqani network in Washington, because they are the ones who, that network is the one who is right. keeping Pakistan army and Pakistan nation on a back foot. Dr. All these machinations have to stop. Dr. This Yasmin, is absolute Mr. Treason. Tegel, uh, we have to go to a short break, but before we toss over to the break, Dr. Yasmin wants to say something. Uh, Madam, would you like to add something? Well, I, frankly speaking, I do agree uh, completely with Mr. Ekram Segal because I think uh, what all he has said, I mean, there's so much of facts and figures hmm. which support that they, uh, there was a memo hmm. and something happened there. That, uh, and the most important part is what you said initially, that if there was, I mean, this, this was a lie or this was uh, something fabricated, fabricated. then they, they should have gone and uh, sued the Financial Absolutely. Times, you know. Madam, we have to take a short break. We have to take a break. This discussion is not going anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Platform, I'm Aisha Tanzeem and we are talking about what is now called Memogate but we want to talk about the impact on US-Pakistan relationship. Ambassador Milam, when we say Admiral Mullen may or may not have been involved or allegedly involved, what, what does it say about the relationship between Pakistan and US? Uh, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I mean, does he have the power Mullen to do something? Mullen is the one who went, sp went 22 or 23 times No, but the question Pakistan. is, even if he gets the memo and if he thinks it's credible, does he have the power to really do some of the things that are requested in Probably the memo? Probably not, no. He, he, that may have been part of his credibility, uh, you know, uh, reaction too. But uh, again, the memo itself, the one I've read at least, uh, it wouldn't have appeared credible to me at all if I had gotten it in my inbox. I would have thrown it where he did, in the uh, non-credible round file. Uh, why, if uh, he cannot do anything about it, is the memo sent to him at all? Well, look, first of all, I think you have to understand that this points to a fundamental problem 
in this relationship. In Pakistan, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories all the time, as if the U.S. has got, you know, the remote control sort of way of dealing with Pakistan. And I think this plays right into that, that, well, you want some internal correction, go to Uncle Sam, get it done. And I think it's very unfortunate for the relationship if this pans out in a way that people believe that, look, whether it worked out or not, this is exactly where our leaders go. This is where they go to get things done. I think it's damaging for the Pakistani leadership. It's very damaging for the U.S. side because I don't think there is that reality to this that, you know, somebody calls up the U.S. and says, do this for me, whoever it is, and it happens. Yes, there have been instances um, where, the, you know, U.S. interlocutors have helped or not, depending on what the situation was. I think there have been some mistakes on the U.S. Past, uh, part in the past. But to imagine the U.S. you know, calling up somebody and changing an internal configuration in Pakistan which is so structurally set, if I were in anybody's place who was deciding here, I would also throw it out. One, it can't happen. Second, the kind of cost even to try that is so huge in the relationship that I don't think any serious person would take it up. But and, it and let, me add, uh, let me add that, in fact, the relationship was in a very bad state at that point, not just because of the Osama raid, which had occurred only a few weeks earlier, a few days earlier maybe, but uh, because of the Raymond Davis affair, which had stretched out for months, uh, uh, just a few months earlier so I think anything that we had tried to do would if it were possible would have redounded to our great disadvantage and made the relationship worse it's bad enough anyway go ahead Maria Right. Uh, now I'd like to ask dr. Yasmin Rashid madam now Hussein Haqqani was nominated for the first time in your party's rally on the twin on the 30th of last month how did Imran Khan many people are asking how did Imran Khan know about this particular diplomat Whereas, you know, the name wasn't mentioned, Hussein Haqqani's name was not mentioned uh, before that. How did Imran Khan know before so anyone else? Basically, if you look at the article which was published in uh, Financial Times, <coughs> it actually mentioned hmm. that this whole uh, memo had been uh, published in it. And it was mentioned that a senior diplomat of, uh, of Pakistani origin based in, uh, in the Abbasi was really responsible for uh, starting off this memo. So I think it's quite easy to put two and two together and I'm very proud of my leader. He's very educated, loves reading and therefore he did put two and two together and the only person he could really think of, as has already been mentioned by Mr. Ikram Segal, is the Haqqani network that we're having a problem in within New York. Hmm. That's why he's talked about Haqqani. Right. Uh, let's cross over to Mr. Segal. Uh, Mr. Segal, I'd like to ask you that, you know, it's being, uh, it's being said that uh, the ca this case is going to be taken to the Supreme Court. Do you think it will yield any tangible results considering that the Supreme Court already has a lot on its plate? First of all, I've got to, I want to go back, Maria, if you let me back to the U.S.-Pakistan sure. relationship. Sure. I think this is going to be do wonders for the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. What has hap been happening with the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has been these uh, uh, Rasputins like Mr. Haqqani who have been going and uh, uh, saying wrong things about the army and the ISI and then spooking the US into doing things which they really do not believe. I am one of those who believe in civilian domination over the military, but a credible civilian domination, not one which is corrupt to the core, because obviously the military is not going to answer to people they know for a fact are corrupt. Therefore, uh, even if, uh, now let's go back to your question, and that is if it goes back to Supreme Court, it's a very open and shut case. It is treason. Now, the treason, as far as Mr. Haqqani is concerned, is very clear. There is no doubt about it. I think the doubt has only been created by the fact of his tweeting people and sending emails to people and coming on. And like he said, I think he just cried on Mr. Kamran Khan's uh, uh, you know, show because he got caught at it. Mr. Haqqani has been doing all these dirty tricks for a long time. You ask yourself this question, he was a part of Mr. Nawaz Sharif's IGI uh, team which brought Mr. Nawaz Sharif into power in the Punjab in 1988. Why did Mr. Nawaz Sharif throw him out? Because of certain pictures that he, Mr. Haqqani floated around the country. Mr. Nawaz Sharif, whatever, I may disagree with him politically, but he's a decent human right. being. And even he could not take it. And he just told Mr. Haqqani that I cannot work with you anymore. So he crossed over to Mr. Be uh, to Benazir and stayed with Benazir off and on till such time uh, that he got right. an opportunity when Benazir was ousted. This matter is very clear as far as Mr. Haqqani is concerned. I think where the problem is, is the smoking gun as far as the president is concerned. That there is an element of doubt. But as I understand it, there are two things which I must bring to your notice. 
what was Mr. Haqqani doing in London? Why was he talking to the chair, uh, Chief of Defence Staff in London and to the Defence Parliamentary Secretary in London? And why was Mr. Right. on that day, on May 10th, Mr. Zardari was in Dubai? So there could have been a conversation with him which could not have been intercepted right. by anybody but between L London and Dubai. Now these are questions which are, uh, you know, which Mr. Haqqani must answer. Right. When there is a Pakistan Mr. ambassador already in London, why was he in London talking to the chief of defense staff? Right. Uh, Mr. Obviously, Mr. this is part of the same, uh, right. uh, you know. Mr. Seigal, allow okay. me to interrupt because we do have to toss to Washington. Before that, Madam, uh, you'd like uh, to add something. Maria, I think it's extremely important. You must understand how damaging this memo has been. It's really undermined uh, the capability of our armed forces, you know. And uh, th th there's been, over the past, uh, you know, couple of years, we've been having this terrible undermining done of the armed forces. And if you look at it, the territorial, uh, you know, sovereignty Maya? which has been damaged by all the drone you. attacks and everything for which we had been protesting has been going on constantly there. And it is it's the civil government which has really been accepting these sorts of right. incursions into Pakistan. Right. Madam, we have to toss to Washington. Now, uh, Aisha, over to you. Uh, Muid, it seems like you want to make a comment about this particular thing, but I want to ask you and also Ambassador Milam, why is it, we also know, this is not the first time, we know through WikiLeaks that people in Pakistan, politicians particularly, come to the U.S. ambassadors, and you have been one in the past, you can tell us why they come, what do they expect to happen? Well, I think Moeen explained it, that somehow they think that we have some sort of f magic mechanism to fix things or to do things that they think ought to be done. Uh, and uh, frankly, most ambassadors uh, will push most of those kinds of people out of the office. So, let me ask you, but, what happens when you tell them, sorry, we cannot do that? It's your problem. What happens Well, then? for me, nothing happened to me. They all no, just I'm went away. But uh, I guess They do all go away. Do they understand that the U.S. doesn't have... Sometimes them? yes, sometimes no, I guess. Uh, but, I mean, this is clearly one of those uh, way, things that uh, they thought... They didn't even bring the U.S. ambassador in. This time they went uh, through... Uh, well, maybe they they went through. I don't know what the story is, but they they think they seem at least they're claiming they went through the uh, Pakistani ambassador. I don't know. Look, I, I think there are two things. First of all, uh, I think the U.S. Uh, has made mistakes in the past, where at least there's been this suggestion and this opening given that you know we'll talk about certain things. Uh, even in the WikiLeaks, it doesn't come across as if this side was too uncomfortable hearing what was being said. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, I think there should be a complete non-interference. What is, whatever is Pakistan's problem, it's Pakistan's problem, they have to solve it. Precisely because of this history, you've got this memo scandal which is becoming believable because it's not the first time somebody would have come out and said something to a U.S. Um, ambassador or general or whoever. Um, what I wanted to clarify is I think we are mixing two things here. One is the issue of the civil military divide in Pakistan and how whether the civilians are bad mouthing the armed forces, whether the armed forces are, are being unfair, whatever that is. That's a substantive issue that needs to be discussed and solved. The other part is the actors involved. Ambassador Haqqani, Mansoor Ijaz. I think for that, you need to have an independent inquiry. You need to give a fair chance to everybody involved. You shouldn't blame and sort of, you know, just have somebody declared guilty before something has happened and that should happen whether it's a Supreme Court whether it's a commission I think there's no way around that that needs to happen immediately but the deeper issue which is a civil military relations I think is problematic because both sides one believes that they have no way internally to correct the balance and thus they go outside and talk to somebody else the armed forces of course believes that this is an internal matter and they're bad-mouthing us they're trying to undermine us by going to an external party that's a deeper issue that Pakistan needs to discuss and resolve because the divide is widening to my mind not not bridging um, thank you very yeah. much uh, Can I say just one yeah, more thing speak getting back to the US relationship with Pakistan I think if the divide widens, there, it could really affect the relationship, and that's not good. Uh, in, in what way? Well, it would. It's you, because it's already, uh, you know, it's already unclear who's running the place and why. Okay. Uh, so and it will just make things more difficult for, for us to figure for, out. For, uh, Mario, what I want to ask your guest is, as Moid Yusuf here pointed out, are they uh, presuming guilt without having a proper inquiry, Madam? Are they presuming guilt yeah. without a proper inquiry? 
Oh, well, I think, I think uh, uh, there are too I, many I, facts and figures which have been shown. And as I said right in, in the beginning, initially, if such a big allegation has been put on the on the ambassador and the government, I think sh something should have been taken right there and mm. then. And they should have taken uh, Financial Times into into the court, you know. That would have at least safeguarded this issue that they probably, right. uh, there's some sort of uh, lies behind all this. Right. However, since they have kept quiet, keeping quiet by itself might at sh times show the guilt, you know. So I believe it's still very important again it's still very important that a proper inquiry should be done and the next important part is that if found guilty then of course the people who are responsible should be taken to task. Was, yes should be taken to task and should be punished properly mr segal you also want to add something please go ahead yes uh, i think uh, you know the fact of the matter remains that uh, shuja pasha who is the dgisi met mansoor ijaz for some time and then he took his time to verify all the facts now that is our premier intelligence institution. Now either we believe them or we don't. I for one do not agree with them on certain of their initiatives but I do believe them in because they took the time before he went to General Kiani and then General Kiani went to President Zardari. Hmm. I do not think that these people would have gone to President Zardari unless they were sure about the facts. Now that by itself and whatever prima facie we have heard from Mansoor Ijaz and what we've seen in the newspapers and what the reaction of Mr. Haqqani is that the only thing that he's talking about is Mr. Ijaz's credibility, what he did at that time. And, uh, you know, first of all, he's, yes, he's right. Uh, Mr. Haqqani did not write the uh, me memo. Yes, he did not. Mr. Mansur Ijaz says he dictated it. Uh, all right. But the point is, those of us who have dealt with Mr. Haqqani over the years and those of us who have seen Mr. Haqqani working behind the scenes Right. And uh, the thing is, this is exactly what he would do. Mr. Now, Mr. Masood Ijaz is finally, uh, either he's got all the resources in the world to have crafted all this mm. in, a, in a very subtle manner, or, and that he is so confident that he's ready to be defamed, to be sued for defamation. Right. I do not think Mr. so. Mr. Sekal, I, want, I, you think to, I <coughs> want you to clarify one point. Uh, many people here in Pakistan believe that the military establishment is not very fond of uh, Ambassador Haqqani, and this was perhaps a way of getting... Uh, him sacked what would you like to say to that I think th that is correct I, I don't think uh, anybody in the army is fond of Mr. Akani but they are not fond mm. of Mr. Akani because they don't trust him mm. because they feel that he is the one who has been inciting uh, the U uh, and giving uh, uh, you know people uh, facts in the United States which are incorrect and I tell you very frankly Ambassador Milam is uh, right out there and I tell you very frankly that once this gentleman is out of the scene, you will see U.S.-Pakistan relationship on an even keel. Because I have dealt with American over 25 years. My company guards the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. I have dealt with Americans. If you deal with them credibility, honestly, Mr. Segal, they will let's always take that believe point you. you just made. Let's take that point, Mr. Segal, you just made. Ms. Ambassador Milam, is he right? Do you think uh, Ambassador Haqqani is uh, a hurdle in good U.S.-Pakistan relationship? I, I don't know, really. Uh, he seems to have been a pretty effective ambassador, but I have no idea what he's doing behind the scenes. I'm not in the U.S. government. I, I never see uh, Ambassador Haqqani except when I need a visa. <laughs> uh, that's uh, rarely. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I don't know whether uh, a change would help or or hurt frankly depended on who was the replacement among other things and as I said earlier uh, you know I'm, I've been an ambassador and I know that we make a difference at the margin but it's not that big a difference because policies particularly in this age of instant communication are made in the capitals and, you know, that's what WikiLeaks is all about. We were reporting all of these approaches back that you talked about. Uh, uh, and Mr. so that's Yusuf, how you know about them. The, Mr. Yusuf, if the ambassadors are not that important and they're just executing the policy coming from above, then why is all this big hoopla about, like Mr. Seikl said, if Mr. Haqqani is removed, Ambassador Haqqani is removed from the picture, U.S.-Pakistan will have a better relationship. Why is this idea of power in the hands of a particular person? Well, I mean, precisely because uh, on in this case, there is a certain segment which believes that the current ambassador is doing more than an ambassador would do and going out of line or whatever the, the script is. Uh, there are others who believe, no, he's actually doing what he's being told. So I think there's a debate on the particular individual. And that's my point. Let's not conflate that debate or his 
uh, sort of dealings or what people think of him and the issue the deeper issue at hand these are two separate things need to be dealt with completely separately now what you also have to understand is that there is a structural problem in Pakistan which is that the ambassador when he's a political appointee is really reporting to the person who's appointed him so I think there's no secret here that the military channel is fairly broken with this ambassador uh, the foreign office and the prime minister are tangential and it's the president which is the direct link so I think there are a lot of people who are rubbed the wrong way when this channel opens and the others are bypassed thank you very much my yes Maria right uh, I said I'd like to go to mr. Segal. mr. Segal, I'd like to ask you that uh, what if this memo is in fact traced back to President Zardari? I know we are speculating. What will happen? What next? That's the million dollar question. There's no million dollar question. It's a very straight answer. If it is traced back to President Zardari, then he must stand a trial for treason. That's Article 6. How can the Supreme Commander go against his own army, against his own army to a foreign country and then try to engage that foreign country in undermining the integrity of the country. There are some things dear to us. We may not agree. We may agree with the Americans on some things. We may not agree with them on some things. But nuclear assets, for example, are part and parcel of our DNA as far as our defense is concerned. That is the credibility that we have in the non-conventional defense. That gives us parity with India. Mm. Obviously, if somebody is trying to uh, you know, undermine that, it is a treasonable offense, whoever it may be. It may be the president of the country. If it is traced back to President Zardari, I'm sorry. In that case, President Zardari has committed treason. Madam, now, uh, it, it's also being said that two other ministers helped Hussein Haqqani draft this, uh, 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 this memo. Who do you think, if we can speculate, who do you think those people are? Frankly speaking, uh, but it might be very difficult to speculate. From what we heard from Mr. Ijaz Mansoor, he said actually that everything was being dictated to him by Mr. Haqqani hmm. himself. So probably uh, I wouldn't really be in a position to speculate on this, but I'm definitely sure that there was some sort of conversation going hmm. on between Mr. Haqqani and Mr. Ijaz Mansoor according to right. the sort of dictation given to him. Because he said that it was dictated to him. Right. He wrote it down and then sent him back. But for we have to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have to toss over to Washington. Uh, their time is running out. Aisha, over to you. Thank you, Maria. We only have uh, a minute and a half. Very quickly, has there any been an incident like this in the past? Forget, forget Pakistan, where the U.S. has interfered in another country's affairs and actually made such changes? I'm, I'm sure there has, but I, uh, I'm, I don't know of any off the top of my head. No, I mean, there have been many, and this is, you know, I mean, let's not sort of go into the normative superpowers do this. You, you, can, you can put out numbers, forget about superpowers, Pakistan has done it many times. Every country does this. Um, the problem is you've got to make this unbelievable at some point. If there is a sense in Pakistan that this can happen, we can go to Washington, get things done, and sometimes things are done, um, then I think there's a problem because there's a tendency for one side to come out and go somewhere else and get the job done the the status quo power institution never needs to get outside because they actually have internal control so i think this problem will continue there will be people who will bite there will be those who will push who, them out of the who office will not bite. but and we should we, stop thinking that we can we're running out of time parties. we thank you you're making a very good point but we have to wrap up from washington we have to thank our guests here ambassador Milam, the former u.s ambassador to pakistan and muid yusuf of the u.s institute of Peace here from Voice of America Studios in Washington. I'm Aisha Tanzim and over to you, Maria. Thank you, Aisha. Now, uh, let's cross over to uh, uh, Islamabad and uh, Mr. Segal. We only have a minute left. Uh, final words from you and then I'd like to come to uh, Madam Yasmin Rashid as well. I think, uh, Maria, the, the major point I want to make out here is that thank God this has come out in the open. Mm. For once, we'll have transparency in all these machinations that have been taking place. I think it is going to be good for U.S.-Pakistan relationship. I think we need each other. I think this is a relationship that can prosper, but it can prosper only if we understand that each has its core interests and we must respect each other's core interests and work along that. There. The United States must go back its, to its ideals. It cannot uh, uh, you know, support a corrupt regime. It cannot support somebody who is known they for doing corruption. That? Aren't they already doing that in other parts of the world? I know it's going to start a, a debate. We have uh, an example right here in Afghanistan where uh, Hamid Karzai is being Absolutely. supported I, by I, the U.S. I, government. I, I, 
yes, I agree with you. And why should they? And I think that is the mistake they're making. And if they, they can correct this mistake, and I'm on record for this, Maria, you know this for the last three, four years I've been saying this. If they correct this mistake and they were an honest, credible government in Pakistan, I don't care who it is because I don't right. want to name anybody. But I think if it is there, you will find a good U.S.-Pakistan healthy relationship it will be good for let's this hope, region. Let's hope that uh, that is what we see in the days to come. Madam, final word from you and then we have to uh, close well, this think, program. Uh, this, is, this is what we actually need, a very honest government. Mm. You see, because if you have governments which are corrupt, at times uh, what we are having at the moment is that corruption breeds all sorts mm. of, uh, uh, you know, cheats, and what we have managed to have is we are being maligned all over the world now and it's very embarrassing i think it's extremely embarrassing mm. not only uh, for it's embarrassing for the people of pakistan and it's embarrassing for us to think about that this these sort of directions are being taken mm. from the uh, uh, are being given to the, the american government basically to interfere right. in our sovereignty and our integrity you know right Madam, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank both my guests, uh, uh, Mr. Ikram Segal in Islamabad and Madam Yasmin Rashid here in our Lahore studios. And we began this program by talking about uh, two subjects, two topics. We were going to discuss Imran Khan's uh, political launch and uh, his uh, political rally, which has created a lot of ripples here in Pakistan. But unfortunately, we did not get the time. We will try to discuss this in some other program. I'd just like to end our program by saying that, you know, we started off with a lot of questions. Some have been answered, others remain unanswered and some new ones have been created. Let's hope that in the days to come, we get the answers we are looking for. This is Mari Zulfikar Khan signing out for tonight. Good night and Allah Hafiz.